Thank you for downloading the latest episode of the Solihull Intelligence Forum. Today's keynote speaker is Mr. Christian Metka from the Jupiter Group. After establishing the company in 2003, their mission is simple, to be the first choice fresh produce company for suppliers, customers and employees globally. Have a listen now to Christian as he tells us about the company. Uh, my name is Christian Metzger, I'm the technical director for the Jupiter Group, um, and we are the best fresh produce company in the world, that's how we see ourselves. Um, we're probably not the biggest, uh, we're not there yet, but with this division we have. And um, be- Before I start the presentation, a little bit of background about myself, um, uh, I'm a Chilean, that's where the accent comes from. I lived in the UK for 14 years now, um, I'm fully uh, uh, become native really, I've got a, a, an English wife and two English children, to, um, I prefer this country to pretty much any other country bar, possibly Costa Rica, uh, not my own. Um, and <laughs> I, um, I've worked for over 10 years in, uh, in the retail industry, um, for everything from, from technical management. I, I'm an agronomist by uh, training. I don't know if any of you know what an agronomist is, but basically a plant doctor. Um, and um, I, uh, I work uh, buying pineapples, uh, looking after customers um, in the retail industry, um, and um, uh, on the technical area of um, fresh produce, which is ensuring safety, safety, legality, and compliance. Really, that's the main things. But um, I'm now the technical director for the Jupiter Group since October last year. Um, after having experience in pretty much any product, fresh <coughs> product that you can think of on the on the on the side of whole head, not nothing prepared, nothing in terms of ready meals. That's not what we do. We don't do bread. We don't do that kind of thing. It's fresh produce. We do. I'll take you first through the story of uh, Jupiter. So, uh, in 2003, it was born um, on the back of um, Philip Maddox's um, um, pack house in, um, in Shropshire, where Mac worked and convinced Philip to give him some money to start trading. Basically, it was Mark and um, a book and a telephone. And he started calling people uh, and setting up his uh, fruit trading business. This is how all the Dutch start trading fruit. They're very famous at trading fruit. Um, in 2004, then we moved into our current location in Newport, um, where we have our offices and our, our main UK pack house and our prepared factory. In 2008, uh, we started with international sales um, out of South Africa. In 2009, um, Martin <coughs> uh, launched the Nancy Cole Foundation, which is uh, 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 named like that in, in, in uh, honour of her granny. Um, in 2010, we opened the office in Cape Town, in South Africa, with a, an export license. We actually were there procuring fruit from um, 2008, but um, that was the first time we, we managed to export it properly from them. 2012, we started our prepared operation in Birmingham. Um, it was called Little Devils to start with. It was strawberries with um, chocolate, and it was uh, Mark's wife, Yvonne, that started that, and now it's a full-fledged prepared factory. In 2013, we opened our office in Chile uh, with the exports license from there of grapes. 2014, we secured a joint venture in India, um, and I'll tell you more about India and how important we are there. 2015, we obtained a master license for Malin, which is a, a variety of black grape um, that was developed in Chile. Um, and we got that license for India, so we were one of the, f- not one of the first, we're the only people in the world to have ever had a variety of anything in India. So that's, when we say we're the best fr- fresh produce company in the world, we, we understand it's a lofty uh, thing to say, but um, we have done things that nobody else has done before, and we really see ourselves as a disruptor in the fresh produce uh, arena. So um, we also gained that um, license to grow in Chile, um, <coughs> And we secured then the next year a 120 hectare farm in Chile. And we are the only non Chilean, I know I am Chilean, but Mark isn't. And he's the one that started sitting on that board, the only non Chilean member, do, member of, the, uh, of the board that controls of those varieties. Uh, we also got the master license for that variety in Greece and the first R license signed, signed for India. R is a breeder of grape varieties based in Bakersfield in California. Um, in 2017, we uh, got exclusivity of our varieties in Greece. Um, we opened procurement offices in Argentina and Turkey. 2018, which is the year I, I joined the business, 
we purchased uh, and fully own a 800 hectare citrus farm in South Africa. Um, this not just that, we've got another two. We've got one in Zimbabwe and one in um, the Western Cape. It's called Sonko Stretch. That's a, that's a hard citrus farm. I'll tell you more about the soft citrus farm and the one in mm. uh, Zimbabwe later on. Um, we have this exclusive, exclusive grape supply of new varieties uh, from um, the third biggest supplier of grapes in um, Spain. It's called Torrera. Um, we own the global breeding rights for three new seedless lemon varieties from Turkey. We're trying to work out how we're going to market that. Um, Hong Kong and Russian sales offices uh, were opened. We were awarded 17th in the Times International Fast, Fast Track 200. So it's, it's not just the lofty ambitions, all the people are independently recognizing what we're doing. Um, and we were awarded a place on the Department of International Trade Great Campaign, which basically means we get free airport advertising in over 120 countries. Um, in 2019, we secured a, a joint venture farm of 1,000 acres in Morocco, which is back from seeing that um, being established. It's already 16 hectares of our uh, Arab varieties being planted there. We gained the master license for our varieties in India, so where there only was what master license means is you can grow the variety, but you are also in control of it if anyone else wants to grow it. So we, we, get, we gain um, the advantage of being very close to the breeder in the country where the variety is being grown. Um, we have the exclusive license for Greece for called DEFCO varieties of grapes and plants. Those are South African varieties. And we were awarded the 22nd place in the Times International Fast Track 200. So we maintained that pace of growth that we were validated against in 2018. Um, we also, two weeks ago, finished the purchase of Cool Fresh in um, Holland, um, bringing limes, melons and pineapple into our supply, as well as garlic and ginger. Mustn't forget about those two. So our, our vision is simple. We will be the best produce company in the world. I started by saying we are the best company, best f uh, fresh produce company in the world, uh, because it's very much the mindset that Mark has and each one of the directors that sits around that board uh, is eight of us. Um, we, we wholly believe in that and we're really fully on board with it. So what we want is the apple effect. We, um, we've sat around the table um, and we talked about different companies we all admired. Um, and uh, uh, fresh, fresh produce is very quite backwards. If you, I, I don't know any of you, if you've been, you've been close to it, it's basically a glorified market store. Uh, it's just people buying stuff, selling stuff, and that's it. There's not a lot of innovation on it. Uh, there's not a lot of technology being used. There's a lot of paper records. There's a lot of... Uh, it's, it's, any business is about people, um, and it's good that it's about people, but in, in produce, it seems to be just about people and nothing else around it. So um, there's a lot, not a lot of innovation. And we said we want to be 25 years ahead of everyone else on fresh produce. Uh, and to us, Apple, even more than Google or Amazon, we're 25 years ahead of everyone else when they came out with the, the iPhone. Um, so how will we become the Apple of the produce industry? We have the tools already, which we, um, we had in place before we decided to um, change our vision, really. And this is our mission and values. So um, we bring them to life at every, every level. Like our mission statement is to be the first choice fresh produce company for suppliers, customers, and employees globally. Uh, how we'll get there is by offering outstanding service and opportunity all of the time. Our values are integrity, which it comes without saying really is, is something that any business needs to have to be able to be successful in our opinion. Trust, not just trust with our employees, uh, but also with our customers. Openness, we don't play politics at Jupiter, and if someone starts playing politics, they, um, they are, uh, we, we use a, a bit of a euphemism, <laughs> which is to, to ask people to go and be excellent somewhere else. Um, we, we don't like politics. Uh, respect and patience that Mark says he was put in there for him, but he keeps reminding me that so often that um, uh, I think he's forgotten that he really is very respectful and patient. But I think it's been because he's consciously looked at what the values are that he wanted to have in the company together with the employees. Um, and he reminded himself so, so much of it that nobody that knows him recently can really think of him as uh, not having respect and patience but whenever he delivers this presentation he will remind you that he put that in there for himself um, to help others and that's where the Nancy 12 foundation comes from uh, not just uh, only internally in terms of developing leaders developing people uh, but also helping the communities that we are imbe embedded in that's very important to us the ethical side of things um, 
work hard and enjoy life because we work on fresh products is absolutely mad. Um, um, if you you've got to imagine we've got products that we sell but they die on us, so our supply chain needs to be really really quick. If we wait, um, we, we kind of keep things in stock for 12 months. Some people attempt to do it and they fail miserably. Um, we uh, uh, like to recognize the success and in fact the meeting I was in before um, you, you join us is how we're going to implement this recognize the success in a measurable way which is um, we, uh, we, we work with, uh, I don't know if any of you are uh, uh, familiar with Franklin Covey and the four disciplines of execution uh, but we use that uh, philosophy in our business um, the wildly important goals um, so a wildly important goal is to really bring that value to life uh, and what we're doing is delivering three pieces of positive feedback to people because we say that uh, people do um, the job right 98% of the time and we only remind them of the 2% that they do it wrong so we're trying to do the, the contrary which is very um, counterintuitive it's a bit like the news the news are always negative N nobody ever puts a good news story out there and, and in business is the same and continual improvement which is really um, essential in produce to, um, to get better all the time so um, our vision explained then is we will be the product experts. We will take new varieties of produce to countries that do not have them. And we will be growers and sell to customers in an international scale. What does it mean to be product experts? Is we, will, we will add value to any retailer at any time. On any day in this area, we will pass any audit at any time on any day by any customer. We will deliver excellence. Now... Um, if any of you have been familiar with uh, supplying retailers in the UK, they have a battery of, uh, I don't know if battery is the right word, but a, a group of lots of different standards that they want you to comply to, uh, agricultural standards, backout standards, ethical standards, pesticide standards. Um, and th that's where my, my department is so critical, uh, the technical side of things, in delivering this vision. Um, because um, if we don't have those requirements in place, we cannot deliver our products um, and what we want to get to is <clears throat> that our products don't really need to have those sub audits. They, 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 they are self uh, auditing in a way. Um, new varieties we will develop and lead uh, on new variety growth and development in all areas. We are product experts, growers. Where we are product experts, we will be growers, which is the reason why we've uh, uh, purchased these farms in South Africa, for example. Global customers, we will supply 180 direct retailers in, mini, in a minimum of 40 countries. What does it mean direct? Um, if any of you have been familiar with the strategies that Tesco and Asda have taken recently in the UK in retail, um, they have gone directly to growers and they cut out their importers. Um, these very big names, at least in fresh, fresh produce industry like Mac and AG Thames in Kent, that have lost massively on this because... Um, they, the Tesco and Sainsbury's have gone directly to the growers and the growers have started to develop their own exporting arms. We're going the other way around. We started as a trader, a very successful trader, and we want to become the grower, the breeder of varieties. And that's where our whole strategy is going. And that, that's what it means direct, so there's no in team intermediary. By working ahead of others as a team, um, in all that we do, and by keeping a simple and focused direction, we will offer outstanding service, which cannot be rebel. So we are one global team with one vision, not departments. We are spread across many, many countries with uh, hundreds of different people in just in the senior management team. Um, and it, it, we want to make sure that we're all pointing in the same direction. We're simple and focused, so total clarity by everyone in Jupiter Group uh, to, to the vision and complete focus on achieving it through excellence. And excellence is something that keeps coming up. Um, Mark is a an avid fan of rugby, which uh, I do not understand why I still got my job, because I'm not. Uh, but I used to have quite a lot more weight on it, and I always say that because I look like a rugby player, I got the job. But um, um, we, the sports philosophy, and you will see this in the video, I'm going to show you in a, in a, in a minute, and, and, and achieving excellence is something that we were really close to. Uh, Mark is, is the coach for the Burton Rugby, rugby Club, and he, he jokes that he, that's his... his uh, um, his permanent job and, and the part-time job is uh, being the MD of Jupiter. Um, our approach to business will lead within the food industry by offering consistency and professionalism in all we do. So um, the Jupiter way is excellent and um, it, that will be to be the best in the world in what we do. So the latest thing we do, for example, is one of our uh, farm managers in South Africa. Um, he, uh, he is based in the far north of South Africa. It's, it's an area called Limpopo to give you an idea. 
um, that's where, if you know anything about South African politics, that's where the economic freedom fighters are from. Um, so it's a very, uh, it's a lot of turmoil and a lot of uh, issues. But he's he's a, he's a white guy, but his son goes to an integrated school, which is a rarity in South Africa. Usually, white people send the children to white schools. So that still happens, um, and they got a really good rugby team on that school, um, a mixed rugby team. So there's, there's black coloured and uh, white people, um, and um, they uh, built a, a scrum machine for the farm. Built a scrum machine for that um, for that school. Um, and it's one of the things that you've probably seen social media from us if you're in LinkedIn or you see you, you, you look for that uh, there'll be a picture of the of the, of the scrum machine uh, and that is one of the things that uh, Hendrik the, the guy that, whose son goes to the school um, applied for funding and, and we, we paid for that machine for that school so that's the kind of things that the the foundation does it's, it's special things special gestures because we think uh, corporate and social responsibility is, is an important thing in and on itself so it's not the, the foundation is not there as a uh, as an excuse not to um, work on our CSR. So, um, our Jupiter principles, and if you know about uh, cycling, you probably recognise this, and you'll recognise it from the next video as well. Uh, commitment, ownership, responsibility, and empowerment, which will result in excellence. Um, so that's what's called the core principle, and we copied that from um, someone else. So because he's, he's already been proved to, proven to work, and he's from Tim Sky. So um, I don't know if you've seen this video, but I think he's, um, he's a very, um, very good um, example of how this is put to work. I think one of my challenges really is I don't coach the riders directly. I coach a team of people, including the coaches, to then coach the riders. If you want other people to perform, it's important that you understand that you need to be a rock, a solid rock of consistency, react in the same way, have a good attitude all the time. And I think attitude is very, very important. At a very simple, basic level, when I walk into this building every day, I might, my motivation might be different. It might fluctuate up and down. But really, my attitude has to be the same. We come in here to win. We come in here to train to win. So I, it's up to me to decide on my attitude. I'm in charge of that. I decide what it is. I'll choose my attitude when I walk into this building, and I think everybody is in the same boat. And I think that's the first and foremost, most important part of any successful program is to really understand yourself and think about yourself and reflect about yourself and how you operate. <laughs> British scientists, we thought very carefully about how to achieve excellence in human beings. And basically we came up with an idea, and we called it the core principle. And first and foremost, the C of the core principle uh, stood for commitment. And we screen people for commitment. Have they got an intrinsic drive towards achieving a goal? Are they committed to that? And commitment's different to motivation in, in, in our book. Motivation ebbs and flows, but commitment's the underlying drive to where we want to get to. We have immensely talented coaches and, and riders who come to this programme, but if the commitment towards the goal isn't present, we won't work with them. It, it has to be a given. And I think when you're working with other people, one of the first things I would always look for is that commitment element. Having established that there is commitment, we would then move on and consider the O of the core principle, which is ownership. And one of the strong beliefs that we have is that not, not many people respond to the old sort of management um, way of dictating control. People don't like to be told what to do. They don't like to be given non-negotiated tasks to be give, you know, to, to, to undertake. They like to be asked about their opinion. They don't like to be shouted at. They don't like to be told off. They don't like people who talk about my performance, my riders, you let me down. So I think this whole idea of ownership is something that we try to work on very hard. And the way it basically worked here at British Cycling to take um, the initiative and, and look at the riders and let them have a say in what they were doing. Let the riders and the coaches have a say in how they want to have their development plans in place and their coaching programmes work and give them ownership. So the way we, we now work is that we like everybody to have an opinion. And it's not... It, it's a professional obligation. It's not. We don't expect people to say, "Well, 
I'll, I'll offer opinion if I want to, or I won't have an individual opinion if I want if I don't want to. You're expected to have an opinion and offer an individual opinion, and then wherever possible, we will work with collective opinion. But I think whenever you want to achieve, really get the best out of somebody, create an environment where people are free to speak. They don't feel frightened or under scrutiny to speak their minds. If they won't speak to you, they'll speak to somebody behind your back and all of a sudden the dynamic within a team will disappear. So really think about this idea of how do we develop ownership over something. We talked about taking the crown off the head of the coach and putting it on the head of the rider and giving them some freedom and real ownership over their performance plans and their training plans. And it was amazing what happened. First and foremost, the, the, the coaches threw their hands in the air and said, this will never work, you know, they won't turn up for training, they need to be told what to do. But of course they won't, because they're highly motivated. Chris Hoy, for sure, leave him alone, he will turn up for training, whether the coach here or not, because he wants to be Olympic champion. But what we found was that motivation levels went through the roof. The coaches actually realised that they were there in a support role to manage and support the riders. And everything really started to flourish in the right direction. There was a bit of second down time, I'll, I'll grant you. But in the main, we actually found that this idea of ownership worked terrifically well. The next step is, if you're going to give ownership to somebody, we have to have in all walks of life responsibility and accountability. You can't get away from it. We all have to live with it. It's part of life. And, and it's important, I think, that accountability is understood and made absolutely clear to every individual, so they understand what they're accountable for, and equally what they're not accountable for, what's expected of them in performance terms, and what's not expected of them to put them in performance terms, what's expected, expected in attitudinal terms, and what's not expected in attitudinal terms. So I think if you take those four elements, commitment combined with ownership, on top of that you understand and make very clear the responsibility and accountability role, that then leads to excellence. And in fact, it's personal excellence that we're talking about. It's not necessarily on the world stage. It's the best that you can be. It's the best that somebody else can possibly be. The, the best that they can work towards and excellence for themselves. And I think that's the really important part. In terms of our... This is outside of our, um, um, our foundation. Um, it's in terms of sustainable uh, plans. So we we have uh, the pillars of community people planet supply chain and technology uh, with below that having education health equality opportunity conservation of the environment relationships transparency innovation and intelligence which in fresh produce is, is paramount really because um there, there's a lot of people we work with and and that are in in situations that are you can describe them as poverty really so, um, because we're working in rural areas in the minimum wage, uh, and there's not a lot of facilities, um, a lot of people haven't got toilets, they haven't got schools, they haven't got uh, running water. So, it's a huge, there's a huge project we're going to South Africa, going the, all down to, to, to the level of social housing for people, um, to ensure that the people that are picking fruit for us, that are working for us permanently in farms, are, are, have got the, the right level of, um, of opportunity, really. To, to improve themselves. So in India it's the same. We are doing the same kind of thing in India. So every project we undertake will incorporate social responsibility, developing communities and educational programs to enhance the future for the next generation. For example, in India we are inputting 100 weather stations worth uh, over 140,000 pounds to cover the whole Nashik growing area, allowing every grower in the area access to the data and systems so we benefit the entire community. In India, they, um, the system we have is, is um, the, the way we work there is very interesting because they're all small farmers, all family farmers, very, very small, less than an acre a lot of the time. And they're in this massive group, uh, so massive, the, the company that we partners with, they do 5,000 containers of grapes a year. So it's not a small amount. Um, but it's thousands and thousands of little farmers together that uh, work in a cooperative way. And um, uh, Vila Shinde, which is our partner there, he's got this system where he buys everything that costs fertilizers, pesticides, uh, tools, um, um, clothing. And then he sells it back to the farmers without any, any gain other than being able to maintain that running. Um, so then by that he can get very good quality fruit where he can make a profit. So it's, it's, it's not about not making a profit, it's about... Uh, ensuring that your community is stable so you can you can benefit yourself. Nashik Valley being the largest wine producing region in India as well. Yes, it is. 
It is, but we are we're not in wine yet. Yeah, pretty much any Indian wine that you can find is a great to grow in New Zealand. So you were all asking about their, their foundation, really, and this this is an example of, of the work they did. So this is uh, uh, an athlete that was sponsored for the Paralympics by us. Local to the area as well. Um, that's uh, some of the people doing the Snowdonia challenge. That's the sar in the middle, that's from our uh, Indian farmers. We believe that this is the last guy that, that managed to go to the North Pole uh, by land. Because this was to try and raise awareness about uh, global warming. It's a, a, a football team in uh, South Africa, um, Rockefeller is the name, uh, Mark thinks it's very amusing. And we sponsor all the kit. This is um, an IT room that we provided for, for a girls' school in India, and that, that girl talking in there, learn English, just to give a speech to Mark and Yvonne when they went to unveil this. We have an exchange program, so we regularly send uh, the Burton rugby players down to South Africa, and then guys from uh, different clubs come up to England to play and learn a job, so it's not just playing. So that's all guys down there doing a bit of tourism. And then when they finish, they need to prepare a presentation of what they've done and what they learned, and they present them in front of everyone at Jupiter, that's a ballroom at Jupiter. This is the last two guys that did the program from South Africa, they're back there, and Dale is working for us in South Africa now. So we uh, also sponsored the, the kit for the Newton's Rugby Club in uh, South Africa. Uh, we support lots of different local events with fresh produce. So this is um, a, a local uh, competition. And this was um, done for uh, in Asia. I can't remember the name of the guy. I think it's going to come up in a sec. Um, they, they, they dress all in this funny collared um, shirts and, uh, and do activities for children and we funded that as well. So the idea of the foundation is, is not, like I said, be outside of CSI, it's to do these special things that allow us to uh, uh, communicate with the communities that we're part of all around the world, not just in the UK. I was at um, the biggest importer of fr uh, fresh produce in the UK before. Well, when they were still one of the biggest, um, uh, the, the Fresca group, which had it started as Mac and it, they started as a, as a market stall in uh, in London in Covent Garden in the 1800s. So they're over 100 years old, um, and they are most famous for Thanet Earth, which is the biggest glass house in the UK, Kent. They, uh, it's a joint venture with a, a Dutch gross, um, and they have three 10 hectare glass houses. A hectare is a football field. So it's 30 football fields worth of salad. Uh, they produce their own power um, and, and basically they, they can produce uh, cucumbers, tomatoes um, and peppers year round. So the, the Dutch guys put the growing know-how and the, the English guys put in the pack house and the know-how selling it to supermarkets. And that's probably that's what the Fresco group is most famous for uh, and what the, the part of the business is still very uh, forward thinking. But um, the other part of the business was buying and selling fruit from all around the world. And I work on the grapes division of MAC. Um, and I developed the Indian business from the technical point of view, so from the growing side, from the packing side. And I, I always did a, a lot of sales, but from a technical point of view, again, in retail, is you go and talk to another guy that speaks fruit to you about customer complaints, about rejections, about um, shelf life, that kind of thing. Um, and I developed all this while it was, was there in, in, in India. Uh, and I had the idea of getting new varieties into India. And every single person I spoke to, in every level, they all thought I was absolutely mad. Um, but how are you going to get varieties in India? They're going to steal them. Like, mm. what happened with pineapples in Costa Rica. The MD2 pineapple that you all know, because the only pineapple there is pretty much, it was stolen from Hawaii. Um, it, it, in reality, uh, it was developed in Hawaii by Dol Del Monte and um, I think Chiquita. I'm not sure if that's the, the, the right third company. And they brought it into Costa Rica to, um, to trial it, and people just basically stole it and put it everywhere. And it was so out of control that nobody could, could really benefit from the intellectual property of that. And basically, people were saying, if we do that with India, that's what exactly what's going to happen, which it hasn't happened. And I was positive it wouldn't happen, but I couldn't find the right mentality, the right vision, the right mission, the right values in a company to, 
to not that the others were bad or anything. They just weren't mad enough, in my view. And one of the one of the first things that I saw is that they they managed to get a new variety of grape in India. That in our, in our industry, it's, it's a massive thing. It's it's a world first. There's no new varieties of anything there because nobody's got this this belief on that country or that system. But Mark had that, and he had the balls, really. Excuse my French, to be able to do it. And to me, that fact, from my personal point of view summarizes why we are going to get where we're going to get and why we are where we are now um, uh, and what motivates me to be where I am now um, that single fact but but it's not just that if you add everything else is people told Mark that he was mad to go and buy a citrus farm in South Africa in that area of South Africa and, and I, I look after that farm I joined in October and I didn't know I was going to look after that farm until the end of October but I'm looking after it now and we're doing it successfully so um, you know, it's, it's a place where someone says something's impossible and says, let's go and do it. So our model of supply is different from uh, all the others. So we offer transparency support and access to year-round supply of new varieties. And we work very closely with ourselves, Jupiter, with the grower and the breeder. What other people do, they either become very close to the grower or very close to the breeder and they separate us two. They, they don't mix the two. We bring them together so there is knowledge transfer between the variety breeder and the grower. This investment and product support a market access from us, so we, we own a lot of the plants that we supply to the, gr the growers. We invest in a lot of joint ventures, and in, in some cases we all right bought the farms. Um, and then we help the breeder with varietal protection. So for a company our size, um, we've got a legal director, which is in charge of ensuring that all these contracts are in place, so we are protecting the breeders. That's how we managed to convince um, uh, Grappa, which is the name of the Arrow variety uh, breeder, uh, that are based in California, it's, it's a bunch of guys from Israel uh, that, that have bred all those varieties. We convinced them to get them in India, but when not, everyone else failed because of that model. And in terms of our growing practices, we're using new technologies to lead the way in farm and crop management globally, and this is uh, deliberately kept a little bit watered down because we're working a lot on um, uh, blockchain and on um, uh, developing paperless ways of working with farms, which... It, you just wouldn't believe how backwards some farms are in the world. You, you, everyone thinks of farming as quite a primitive activity, but um, uh, it's quite different from an arable crop moving to a fruit crop. Fruit crops still quite traditional. Uh, arable crops are working with GPS and automatic tractors and self-driving tractors. Because it, it, no disrespect to them, it's, it's a bit easier to, to farm wheat, for example, than it is to farm avocados or grapes. But this is what's coming in that, and we're working really closely with them. And we're also developing an old technical standard, and this is this is my baby, really. Uh, which the idea is to develop the best uh, fresh produce um, production standard and packing standard in the world, so we don't have to um, depend on other people for uh, auditing. Uh, through constant analysis and feedback of the standards, uh, we will adapt accordingly. It will be highly prescriptive rather than deliberately left deliberately open. Um, um, so, uh, with the aim of achieving excellence. There's many uh, auditing standards where they give you guidance and the guidance is very thin. So then you're open to an auditor to ask strange questions. Uh, does not need an expert to be interpreted, so we want to build it from the bottom up rather than the top down. Everything's built top down at the moment. Uh, and we want to use uh, evolutive iteration to build it. So um, it's, it's going to take us a while, but uh, by the time it's finished, it will be pretty much perfect. That's what we expect. Uh, and auditing is done primarily on records rather than on procedures. That's the procedures that there is a given. They are... Um, um, they, they are they are there um, um, as a given and um, there is to link this with our marketing um, department as well so any farm that you go from the Jupiter group it will look the same as any other farm in, in the world in terms of signage, in terms of practices in terms of systems so a little bit more about um, oh I jumped that, our blockchain vision then is um, we are specifically designing this for um, the Chinese market why the Chinese market and not the British market yet um, it's because uh, the British British uh, customers are, are not always aware of uh, what happens with the fruit. And we think if they get the opportunity to scan something and see what everything that happened, they're going to think, oh, it's been touched by too many hands or whatever. But in China, uh, this, 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 uh, the, the consumers are very um, conscious about what's happened with their products before because of the scandals they've had with uh, milk in the past in particular and also with meat. So 50-year-old meat in China and milk contaminated with plastic is not something that... Um, people are against knowing more. So the idea is that we sell them a product they can scan and they will be able to see the certifications the farms have, the certifications the backhouse have, 
and it, all the pesticides that were applied to that, to that particular crop um, and when the different quality control points were uh, on that chain. So that's, that's the start of a, of a blockchain. And we're working with very important partners like Beto and Sage on that. That's amazing that they, you, know, you, you pick some grapes up and then you can scan it and see all of this. That's, that it's something that's really growing even in this country. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're big on your food provenance, aren't you? Yeah, so I mean, it's all about local, I mean, the is about local, local meat, local produce, all that. I mean, I was going to ask a question actually for a global company yeah. like yourselves, how do you look at one, <coughs> the, the provision of local produce grown here in the UK um, and kind of the distance it travels from kind of, as I say now, from farm to fork. Um, and then secondly, about packaging and uh, ethical packaging and recycling, all that kind of stuff. Those two we, it's quite important. I can, I can give you a good answer on one of them and a bad mm -hmm. answer on the other. We, mm -hmm. uh, well, main customer in the UK are retailers and around the world. And retail is all about 365 years. Mm. Sorry, 365 day, day a year supply. So you need to be able to supply grapes all the way around. And the grapes in the UK, you can grow them for wine, you can't grow them as ta table grapes because it basically wouldn't last on the shelf. I don't see it as outside of a remit to try and grow them in the UK. Mm. But the levels of volume that you need is you need a, a country that's able to produce tons and tons and tons of, con of, of um, 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 grapes like India, like yeah. um, um, South Africa, and we see uh, the way that we're giving back is in our corporate social responsi responsibility policies because the need for those products are always going to be there. Now, uh, we never have been about local product, we've been about bringing the world round. And the way we say is, we are a, a, your, we are a British grower that operates globally because um, Mark and Yvonne's background is, is, is farmers, and uh, not a farmer themselves, but the families are farming and they um, studied at Harper Adams, that's where they met and where they developed this idea of Jupiter together. By the way, Jupiter is uh, called Jupiter because um, they wanted to use a name that meant the same on any language. Um, I think Mark wanted it to be called Top Mark at the beginning, but I think Yvonne, Mark and Yvonne, if you ever met them, they are, they are very much a unit. Um, um, I think Yvonne convinced him that it wouldn't be Jupiter. And to any of you that say, what, you got a, a ring around uh, Jupiter, is that Saturn? Well, uh, Jupiter has got a ring. Just to be able to see it, you need infrared vision. So you all have superpowers. So um, that's uh, from, from the blockchain point of view. Um, you had, uh, the, your first question was about uh, local and your second yeah. was about packaging. We've got mm -hmm. a packaging department and there's a lot of innovations that are happening on packaging. But we well, are, in a way, is a, plastic is a big thing now, it is it? a massive thing. Yeah. And, um, for example, if you look at the pineapples that we, we all have, because we are quite cool, cool fresh, we've um, we got um, over 50 containers of pineapple that we bring from Costa Rica on a weekly basis into Europe, and they all come without um, any, yeah, any packaging. It's, it's a cardboard box yeah. that we, we recycle. So that's a na naturally plastic-free product. But you think of grapes. Um, grapes are so delicate that they need all this packaging around them. And there is alternatives like pulp, um, but if you think, I'm a, a, a very technically minded person, so you think of the cost of pulp mm. compared to plastic, it's about seven times more expensive. And uh, the fresh produce industry is all about margins. So until the, the retailers don't change their pricing structure and they don't change what Waitrose is doing now, just very recently, with uh, mm. these refillable containers, you could yeah. have, a, a, for example, a fruit counter where people Bring could. Your own container. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. That's where the solution lies rather than on. Um, eliminating plastic completely because we need some sort of way of protecting the fruit we could use paper we could use paper pulp but the uh, macroeconomics of it uh, the particular economies of scale in it they do not add up um you know it's um there are solutions out there but without the final users changing their habits we cannot change ours in a way we cannot innovate that way in my opinion we can we can try we can produce a, for people like booths and um uh, budgets supply uh, pole panets, uh, uh, but, but the only reason why they can do it is because they've got volumes that are low enough that can sustain that sh the, the, the production rate of that is much lower because it cannot be as fast as plastic. So then the cost is much higher, but they're selling it to people that can afford it. So if you want to make really big solutions, you need to sell fruit without it in your store, and um, retailers need to be thinking of eliminating shelf life completely and getting people into the habit of you buy today, you eat it today or tomorrow. It's not going to last five days. Because that's why it's got plastic in it. It's going to help the shelf life of it. It's what you said earlier as well, which was interesting around um, the likes, the mighty Tesco's and Sainsbury's sort of trying to go round people like you to get straight to the grabbers. Yeah. 
but you're sort of, and you use the word disruptor, yeah. it's a big yeah. word that's been used by a lot of people, yeah. you're trying to go the other way, yeah. you know, and, and, and effectively sit as the grower. Yeah, we're, ber have that direct, so we're vertically have integrated. There, I suppose, yeah. you? You but this, this growers have done it the other way. There's a good example in our industry is Carsten, which is South African, the biggest South African gro grower of grapes. And they, uh, they establish a pack house. They've got a pack house in, I think it's in Lincolnshire in, uh, in the UK. And they supply the retailers directly that way. Um, but he all started, uh, you know, he all started from Tesco, really. They're the ones that started with the direct model. And yeah. he wasn't. It wasn't about inter uh, vertical integration, it was about cost cutting. It was about profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pure profit, yeah. 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 I mean, they did the same in the, I mean, our family's background is in clothing. Yeah. So we were clothing wholesalers. And then when ship markets came to do clothing, again, going direct to China. Yeah. Where we were bringing in the stuff from China. Yeah. <coughs> and then we said, they've gone straight there and cut the middle line. Yeah. But the, in reality, the, 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 the gains are quite marginal. Because the Tesco realized that I worked at Ford Tesco at that time. And um, they had to create their own buying structure and their own bigger technical structure and their own um, account management structure. Um, and that's cost as well. So yeah. I think one of the things that they walk up to, now it's more of a hybrid model, is supplies when making as much money as they thought Tesco was. Tesco was thinking that they were doing more money, but so, sometimes you get lucky, obviously. But, but this is not it's a new concept either, is it? If you, like, look at the, just thinking yeah, that. Yeah, look at the... Port houses in Portugal, you know, um, you know, in Porto, uh, Wares and Taylors, and where did all those British names come from? They all come from thinking. I'll tell you what. Instead of we'll cut the middleman out, we'll go and we'll go and right, actually right. pitch up in yeah. in Portugal, or, and, and the you know sherry as well, wasn't it? You know, going back in, you know, the sort of old trade. And you know, why world. where the or, or varietal strategy comes from is to be able to have product that. Is consistent year round for all these different countries. So when you go to the supermarket, and you pick your panic of grapes. When you change season, you don't notice it. At the moment, yeah. you can re I can tell very easily where it's come from just by the way it looks. So we're currently with a lot of Egyptian grape uh, and leftover Indian grape in in shelves, and it's not looking great really. Um, but um, some consumers don't realise. But if if you want repeat purchases, you want that consistency. You want that flavour there constantly. Um, you want complaints to stay low, um, so that's that's the whole strategy behind it. Are you involved at all with the, with the EU areas with the genetic modification? Not at all. No. The only place where genetic modification in a, in a way, but it's not really genetic modification, is some of the breeders of fruit, not grape, but they've used it in um, in soft fruit uh, berries. Um, they use markers to identify certain genes, so they, 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 they look for a particular gene, say for size, and they, they use, uh, it's not trans, uh, transgenic techniques, but it's techniques to mark those genes, to be able to see them in results, to see if the genes have been inherited to a particular set of variety, so then they can select the ones that have it and not use the ones that don't. But in reality, the, the breeding is, is just traditional. As you get two flowers together, you get, uh, you get the seeds from that, you put them in different pots, you evaluate them all, mm. and then you do that again mm. and again and iterate the same thing. But it's very slow when you do it by trying to look at the expression of that fruit. You, you lose time. So you can use technology to be able to do it quicker. Um, but in fruit, um, it's not very common. It's, it's very common on the arable side. Corn, potato, um, legumes, and all that kind of thing. Um, rice, I mean, this, it, you've probably heard about the golden rice uh, thing in, in India and, and China, where they've added, um, um, bit, I think it's vitamin D or vitamin E, I don't know what vitamin, uh, to rice to be able to uh, make it more nutritious, and that's a transgenic thing. The majority of the soy in the market is transgenic. I'm pretty sure there must be some, mm -hmm. some things as a transgenic free in the market that have got some transgenic soy on it, which is resistant to uh, pesticides, so herbicides. Argentina, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, they're full of transgenic soil. So as a company, you have, you have a view on genetic modification? I've got a personal view, but as a company, we don't need to because fruit doesn't really get involved with transgenic. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a key thing to be able to feed the world, especially with grains. If you don't, it's, it's, you know, a lot of the, of the fears of it are ill-informed. Mm -hmm. uh, and based on emotion, like anything in this world nowadays. I mean, talk about global warming, for example. It's, nobody looks at the evidence, which, which is that it's real, but people act on opinion rather than looking at fact. And with transgenics, um, if they're done properly, you're not going to affect the environment in a significant way. However, if you don't do it properly, you're going to also affect this uh, problem with it, uh, um, the, the gene that they put on corn in the US to kill insects. 
and they end up killing uh, uh, monarch butterf butterflies. So mm. it's a tool. Uh, you can use it to, you think of a nu nuclear technology, you can use it to build atomic bombs or to treat cancer. Mm. I mean, it's, it's nothing to do with the tool, it's to do with the way it gets used. So that's, that's my personal view on it, but it's not a Jupiter's view by any means because we don't, we don't deal with transgenic uh, products. Um, in terms of our grape production then, so what we're talking about, where we're based around the world, uh, we are in both hemispheres and in the northern hemisphere. We have a thousand uh, acres um, planted over the next three years in Morocco. In Spain, we have Etum and IFG varieties, is the names of breeders. Uh, Etum is a Spanish breeder, IFG International Fruit Genetics is an American breeder. 500 acres over the next three years, and Greece, we have exclusive varieties, which is Ara and Malin, um, in a thousand acres planted over the next, next three years. In the south, southern hemisphere, we have 500 acres planted in Namibia. In South Africa, to be confirmed, we, we might have one of them acquisition news coming. Um, in Chile, 500 acres plant, planted over three years. Um, in India, 5,000 acres planted with exclusivity on Ara. Um, so the, the total production, the 12 month supply of varieties can be seen there. The idea on grapes is to jump from one country to the other um, and always have our own production that's under our own control. Um, and this is a three year growth plan on the different varieties, those other colors. So you, you have um, um, white or green varieties. Um, you have black varieties in the middle, the purple ones in, in color there. And these are red varieties. So we've got a very um, ambitious uh, growth plan. And to um, put that in context, context. Um, compare that to the global grape production. Where do you sit? Are you a? We I, I wouldn't be able to tell you uh, because China and India are massive. But what I can tell you is that our uh, goal is to be twenty five percent of the market on each country that we grow stuff in. Yeah. So we want to be the twenty five twenty five percent of citrus, South African citrus, twenty five percent of Chilean grapes, twenty five percent. That's our aim, and that's what we're working hard to achieve. And I think I haven't been part of this company uh, for a short period, but seeing how it's evolved over the years, we're probably going to be 30. So, um, we don't get on the time list if you're not growing that quick. So, yeah. You know. so, um, so South Africa, then, which is very, uh, very dear for me, I spent a lot of time uh, managing that area. Um, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, we've got a farm in Masui, which is the farm in the, the, the far north in Limpopo, one of the first production areas to harvest. Lemons, grapefruit, and Valencia oranges. We're doing the Valencia oranges now. We're investing a huge amount of money on um, um, corporate social responsibility projects. We got um, a two run per box of exported um, um, class one fruit that we keep away to reinvest in the community. So we don't. We, we, it's, it's a bit like our own fair trade scheme in a way. Um, we. Um, have a farm in Zimbabwe, and this farm might be famous for the wrong reasons in Masoi because it used to belong to Grace Mugabe, and half of the farms was uh, expropriated without compensation in the past before we um, we acquired control of it, um, and that that part lies abandoned now. But Zimbabwe stopped the uh, expropriation without compensation movement, and they are very quite uh, open to new business now. Uh, there are issues with the UK in terms of trading fruit from uh, from Zimbabwe but there aren't that many issues in Europe or globally. So uh, we export them through South Africa, and we work very closely with them. But this, this got its own very um, particular challenges. We had to have our own electricity supply. We had to have our own water supply because the services are not really uh, reliable. And South Africa is going the same way. We are putting in plans for uh, our own power supply in our pack house um, because of um, the issues with ESCOM, the supplier of electricity in um, in South Africa, which is, has gone to uh, what they call load shedding several times on the past months. Um, Can I just ask, that's, that seems to be quite an investment. Yeah. To be putting power in and things like that. Yeah. How, how do you fund something like that? Is uh, that through what you're selling or is that through the countries themselves? Are they helping? Uh, we we are funding it um, through what we're selling and our acquisitions as well because we're, we're funding new, we're basically growing by acquiring other companies. Like I said earlier, just two weeks ago, we doubled in size. Um, so that's one way we're doing it. And the other one is um, we're, we're using banks to fund, fund us because we, they believe in, in our vision and because we're so radically different from everyone else. I think we get um, we get a very good buy-in in terms of our plans for the future. Um, you know, I can 
I, I kind of go into a lot of detail on what the future looks like for us, but it gives you a flavour. So, um, finally, we've got Songposter, which is a farm on the Western Cape that three this smallest. We've got 30 hectares, which is very strategic for us because it's got soft citrus. Um, in Costa Rica, we have 300 hectares, this is a joint venture. Uh, unfortunately, have further 800 available to plant, and it's very interesting because all the pineapple waste is used to feed cattle, um, and we don't produce any waste. And all the water is recycled that is used in the plants, so and no all water is used. Um, this is a zero water footprint, which is very important. Um, so it's a close look for all food waste, and um, it's it's really a, an example of uh, industrial farming that's sustainable. Oh. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, project that we inherited with our coal fresh partners in Holland. Um, and finally, you've got uh, uh, a word about the Jupiter standard, which is what would I talked to you about just before. Um, and I think that's another video here. Take you around the world looking at all the different farms. <coughs> That's just two months ago when they were harvesting lemons in uh, Masue. So this is this is the video that we showed to people in our farm when we committed to improve the quality of life. Um, we had in inherited the farm that um, had been not farmed but mined really systematically. So um, I've been to some of our customers talking to them about uh, what we do there, and I, I got. It probably hasn't come in this uh, uh, presentation, but I've got a very uh, dark sense of humour. And I make jokes all the time to put uh, points across with people that in my industry or with people in my team. And um, when I say that the, the pack house is from 1950, people thought I was joking. And the pack house in that farm is from 1950s, it's not. You know, it's something that is from the 1980s and it's dated and old and I'm calling it, it's from the East, literally from the 1950s. So we are, we are um, at the moment we are packing on the old packers and we're building a completely brand new 21st century packers on the side uh, as we pack on the old line. Um, and people are aware that we're not just going to, we're, we're building that with, with money and finance of our bank. Uh, that's what we're doing. But then the money we make, we're going to invest back. We want a shop, we want a church, we want uh, um, a little hospital. Um, we want places for people to play rugby, to play cricket, to play football. Um, we don't just want to take all the wealth out of the country um, and forget about them, because uh, it's not what Jupiter is about. So well, you're pr protecting your, your productions, aren't you? Exactly. After the people and that. Exactly. Especially in the area we are in. So we, I've got several. Um, um, ah. And then we produce the same version on the local language in Bender, or um, we've uh, really disrupted the farming environment in, a, in our own farm because uh, it was all a bunch of white guys, really, which they are very good white guys, so don't get me wrong. But we put uh, uh, a black woman that speaks Bender in charge of HR. So uh, that's the kind of company we are. We found the best person we could possibly find to do that job and we put them in that, in that role so it builds community. It's not just about the typical poor farmer, which we want in our business, but we also want to build the next generation of leaders in the local area. The guys that are likely, if they are in discontent, to go and join the EFF, we sure don't want that. We had a, we had a, um, a union in, in place, um, and when you say union in business, people just cower and go on the tables or whatever, especially in this country with the history. But um, the union turned out to be fake. It was a guy that was taking money from people to say that they were representing <laughs> representing them. And, and we, we got uh, all that sorted out, and people, as a consequence, trust us more now. Um, but um, that's the kind of environment we are operating in. It's very, very challenging, but also very rewarding. So. Well, that's it. the end of my presentation. I can take more questions if you wish. Um, I've great. tried to make the best I can of that. Uh, of a baby that's Mark's really my my uh, my boss, uh, the ma managing director of this company, uh, has, has really honoured me with uh, allowing me to talk about this here.